the next presentation with Tony Hunter, Global Food Futurist Speaker from Future Cubed. Uh, this session comes to us with thanks to our sponsors in SciTech Pivot. Tony is a global futurist, he's a food scientist, he is an author, a strategic foresight consultant specialising in the future of food and agriculture. He thrives on advising global food and ag companies on the technology and consumer trends shaping this rapidly changing sector. Using his distinctive combination of scientific qualifications and business experience and detailed understanding of food technologies, he's delivered a unique perspective on the future of food, which he will be doing to us shortly. I've also managed to find out that he is a huge sci-fi fan, which is not surprising, I guess, for a futurist. So with that in mind, please put your hands together. May the force be with him, Tony Hunter. Thank you, Andrew. Well, the first question I usually get when I tell people that I'm a food futurist is, what is a food futurist? What do you do? Well, one thing I can't do is I can't predict the future. I can't get out a crystal ball and tell you exactly what the future of food will be. If I could, then this is what I would be doing. I would be on my yacht, my mega yacht in Saint-Tropez um, in the harbour there enjoying a wonderful meal. But of course, I'd much rather be in Adelaide talking at Hawk Connection. But what I can do for my clients is I can look at all the technologies and consumer trends that are coming into food and prepare what we futurists call alternative futures. That's a set of futures that could come to pass. And then what we then do is we follow the events as they happen and see which of these futures are likely to become reality. And you might then say, well, why bother exploring alternative futures? If you can't tell me the future, what use is that to me? Well, the answer to that is simple. We explore the future so we can make the best possible decisions today. In other words, we look at the future and then we extrapolate backwards to the present to make the best possible decisions for our organizations to optimize our competitive ad advantage. Um, and of course, that begs the question of, well, what events do we need to follow? I mean, if you're like me, every day you have this avalanche of information. You have newsletters, podcasts, webinars, conferences, the latest Hort Connection report, all to read this avalanche of information, providing you with a dizzying array of things which could affect the future of your organizations. So this was the problem that one of my friends, John, had. Um, and I think, how do you feel about all the information you get? Ever felt this overwhelming mountain of information, and not just this overwhelming mountain of information, but to make sense of it, and what does it mean? And I said, my friend John had this problem. And I asked John one day, I said, John, how do you keep up with all of this information? And he looked at me, and he said, Tony, I've got problems to solve, meetings to go to, people to recruit, quarterly results, and I've got the three-year strategic plan due next week. And you want me to think five, 10, 20 years into the future? Not gonna happen, he said. What I said to John was, John, what you need is a roadmap, a roadmap to the future. And I think the best roadmap to the future is built upon technologies. And he said, well, why technologies? Well, I said, you cannot talk about food from farm to fork without talking about technology. Food used to be a sleepy technological backwater compared to things like the electronics industry. But no more. Technology is now everywhere in food. And I told him, though, that it hasn't always been this way. And for me, things really started changing about six years ago in 2017. 
like John, like all of you, I was getting my newsletters and I'm seeing technologies that I didn't know existed. I'm seeing other technologies and trends happening way faster than I thought they could. So I dug deeper and the deeper I dug, the more fascinated I became. And after six years of research, I've come to the conclusion that we're approaching the intersection of five exponential technologies driven by three accelerator technologies that will determine the future of food for decades to come. And that, I said to John, is why my roadmap to the future of food is built upon technologies. And his face brightened up as he said, ah, so now I've got a way through this maze of all the information that's piling up around me. So what are these five technologies? The first one is alternative proteins. The next one is cellular agriculture, genomics, the microbiome, and synthetic biology. And I'm sure that Max had a quick sneak look at my deck before he did his talk. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap there, but I think that just serves to, to reinforce some of the changes that are coming to the industry. And our three accelerator technologies are AI, quantum computing, and sensors, all leading to our exponential food future. And I'm sure you're all wondering, what is a exponential food future? Well, it's built upon two key concepts. The first is that food is now technology. As I've said, you can't talk about food from farm to fork without talking about technology. It is everywhere. And if there's one thing that we know about technology, is technologies advance exponentially. And a good example of this exponential growth um, is computing. I say, Max went back to 1969 to the moon landing. I'm going to take you back to 1975. Portable computing 1975 style. My friend Robert L. Gordon here has his hand on the first portable computer, the IBM 5100. And I too used to have hair like that at one stage, but uh, that is a whole other story. Now, would anyone like to have a guess as to how much the world's first portable computer weighed? Someone, give me a guess. How many kilos? 40, any more? <laughs> it weighed 23 kilograms. Do not put that on your airline tray table. It is not going to end well. And fully spec'd up, maximum memory, maximum storage, a printer, some offline storage, that cost the princely sum of 19,750 US dollars, which in today's terms is 110,979 US dollars. And even more staggering is that this computer, its maximum storage was 64 K, not megabytes, certainly not gigabytes, 64K of storage. Now, even more staggering though, is that my Samsung Galaxy Fold here, same size screen as the 5100, has four million times the storage at one one thousandth of the cost, at one one hundredth of the weight. That is the power of exponential change. And one thing with exponential change, it's very dangerous to live linearly in an exponential world. As we see with our friend here, down the bottom left, they say, I know what's going on, I know what the future will hold, and they extrapolate, and they extrapolate along that dotted line. And that's a nice straight line. They look up sometime later and they go, oh, this is not where I expected to be because that dotted line was really not a straight line at all. It was a start of an exponential curve. And where they end up, I say, is not where they expect it to be, and that is the exponential shock factor. So what do these concepts lead us to? 
Well, food is now technology advancing exponentially. The future of food is now tech exponential. So to understand our tech exponential food future, we need to explore the power and understand the five technologies driving this tech exponential food future. And the first of those is alternative proteins. And we've heard a little about alternative proteins um, this morning. Um, and there are some interesting applications of alternative proteins. Is there anyone here from the turf industry? Can't see any hands with the turf industry? Shout out. Oh. Anyway, there's a company in the Netherlands called Grasa. Innovative name. They grow grass for human consumption. They claim they can grow 2.5 times as much protein from an acre of grass as an acre of soybeans. So they can cut out the middle cow and go straight from, human, from grass to human food. Similarly, there's a company in Australia called Leafed, and they are actually doing the same thing with other plant leaves because the protein in grass and in leaves generally is a protein called Rubisco, which is part of the photosynthetic cycle. And it is the most abundant protein on the planet. If you can tap into that, you tap into the biggest source of protein there is. Of course, we eat leaves, but we only extract a small amount of nutrition from green leafy material because our digestion can't break down the cell walls. That's why cows eat grass, and up until now, we don't. And our next technology is cellular agriculture. And you're probably all familiar with um, cellular agriculture, where you take a few cells from an animal and you grow meat in huge fermenters. And the product that we've got here is a chicken nugget from a company called Good Meat. This has been on sale in Singapore since December 2020. It's already here. And they've just recently had approval to sell their chicken breast in um, uh, butchers called Huber's in Singapore. So if you get to Singapore, you can go and eat this product right now. But it's not just confined to animal cells. So who here likes chocolate? Got a few takers, yeah? Oh yes, yep, chocolate. I hate to tell you, chocolate is under threat. Low pollination, disease, lack of labor, as we've heard, deforestation. All of these things are combining to put strain on our chocolate supply. Now, a company called California Cultured, they are growing cacao plant cells in stainless steel fermenters, and they are growing the components of chocolate, things like flavanols and other components, so we can breathe a bit easier in that our supply of chocolate is looking quite safe. And of course, if you're like me, like coffee with your chocolate, makes a nice end to a meal, I've got to tell you the same thing, the coffee plant is also under siege. Again, disease, pollination, everything else is combining to reduce the supply of the Arabica bean, Robusta, called Robusta because it's more robust, um, Arabica is not doing well. With climate change, we're seeing shortages in Arabica beans, and a company called STEM is addressing that by growing the um, Arabica plant cells in fermenters and then structuring them in 3D to make the nibs which are used to make coffee. And our next technology is genomics. Now, we've heard a bit from Max about, um, our, uh, about genomic gene editing and G GMO, but Who's heard of atomic gardening? Anyone? Atomic gardening? Well, atomic gardening became popular in the 1950s. Now, this was part of the US Atoms for Peace process. Having seen nuclear weapons used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they wanted to try and show it can be used for peaceful purposes. And this is one of the things they come up with. Atomic energy for the farmer, a true radioactive soil conditioner, not a fertilizer, it lasts for 20 years, and is quite harmless. 
If anyone would like some, um, I'll be on the Hawk Connection stand and I can set you up with a couple of containers if that's something that takes your fancy. Or maybe in your marketing, you'd like to think of this. Use a mushroom cloud on your marketing. And these are real live pictures from the 1950s. Now, this has been going on Genetic modification through using radiation and mutagenic chemicals has been around for about 100 years. And it's been taken up seriously since the 1950s and 1960s. At the moment, there are nearly 3,500 food and ornamental crops made through random mutation using gamma rays, X-rays, other radiations, and mutagenic chemicals like formaldehyde. 3,500 products in the market. A good example is the atomic grapefruit, the Rio Red. This comprises three quarters of all the grapefruit grown in Texas. And it was made that way by, you guessed it, gamma radiation. And one of the other staple crops around the world, of course, is rice. And here we have space rice. The Chinese have been sending rice into space exposing it to cosmic radiation and microgravity, bringing it back to Earth, and then selecting from those seeds the traits that they want, like increased yields, um, ability to um, perform under different climates. And at the moment, there are about two million hectares of space rice that have been grown in China. And in case you think that's only for China, those of you who knows Calrose rice, the original parent was produced by gamma radiation. So, I don't know about you, but when people tell me about off-target CRISPR um, mutations, I have a smile to myself at the random mutations that have been used to produce food to date that are now considered traditional breeding methods. I can go out and gamma radiate what I like and sell it to whoever I like. She edit something, oh, I don't know about that. I mean, she, oh, well, hmm, need to worry about that. And some of these products produced through mutagenesis can be called organic. And to revisit one of Max's slides, this is the company called Pearwise. They're the ones who have gene edited mustard greens to take out the bitterness and other adverse flavors, and it's now for sale in the US. But not only that, they're now working on black raspberries, seedless blackberries, and pitless cherries. Because what they're saying is, what stops people from eating more fruit and vegetables? Sometimes it's, I don't like to get the seeds caught in my teeth, or I'm gonna pit the damn cherry again. I mean, pff, the first world problems we have are having to pit our cherries, it's terrible. So all of this design to get people to eat more fruit and veg by becoming making the products more easily, more easy to consume. But it's not all about GMO. We have a company called Row 7, and what they've done is they've used conventional breeding techniques, and they're using that to produce potatoes, which with a little bit of salt, apparently have the same sort of flavor and texture as other potatoes, standard potatoes, using a lot of butter. So you can use selective breeding to go back and look at um, existing crops. And then if we look at the AI breeding side of things, we have a company here called Benson Hill. Now Benson Hill are making ultra high protein soy and they're using their AI to conduct genomic analysis, simulations and predictions to target certain traits of the products that they're interested in. In this case, making an ultra high protein product suitable for making alternative protein products. And that's important because you want the least amount of processing possible in your products from a consumer point of view. And our next technology is the microbiome. And we have a company in the US called Pivot Bio, and what they have is a soil microbiome. And that soil microbiome means that you use 45 kilograms per hectare, less synthetic nitrogen for the same yields in products and crops like wheat and corn. And we all know 
what's happening to fertilize the cost. Cetaic nitrogen and phosphorus going through the roof, particularly with the Russia-Ukraine war at the moment. So you can imagine this company is pretty popular and they have um, successfully um, used this product on millions of hectares of land in the US and they've sold out every single year and they continue to, um, to sell out. And the next thing we, one we have is synthetic biology. And, you know, a lot of people will go, oh, GMOs, and we saw some figures on GMO. And uh, I saw a, a video once at a conference, and um, they asked the person in the street in the US, what is a GMO? Uh, genetically, um, GMO, uh, I'm not sure, I just know that GMOs are bad. It's as if you could go in and pick out the GMOs out of your food, get rid of the bad bits. So people really don't know about GMO. And one of the best examples of synthetic biology, believe it or not, is cheese. Who likes cheese? Eh, lots of takes. Who, who doesn't like cheese? Not too many people don't like cheese. Let me tell you the story of cheese. And there's probably a little bit of a poetic license, artistic license here, but how was cheese invented? Well, the theory is one day a dairy farmer in Europe somewhere wanted to take some milk from their cow to their friend in another distant village. And they were looking around and saying, what have I got to take it there? I don't want to take a bucket backwards and forwards. What am I going to do? Oh, I know. I have a spare calf stomach lying around. So they put the milk into the calf stomach. Off they go. They go along. And it's a hot day. And it's getting a bit warm. But they see their friend. They haven't seen them in a while. And they get to their friend's place. And they say, I've brought you some milk, friend. And they open it up. And it's gone all lumpy. But being the adventurous type, our friend, the dairy farmer, takes out the lump, squeezes them, and tastes them, and goes, you know, that's not bad. wonder what we could do with this. And thus was born cheese. Now, originally, the fourth stomach of the two-day-old dead calf was what was used to make cheese. But of course, we've got a bit more refined with our technology, and we managed to extract the components called rennet, from the calf stomach, and that was used for a long time to make cheese. But in the 1980s, cheese consumption was rising rapidly, and also the producers realized two things. One, there's not going to be enough dead calves around to make enough cheese. And secondly, some people were getting a little squeamish about killing two or three day old baby calves for their fourth stomach to make cheese. So our friends at Pfizer, who make the vaccines, they took the gene for chymosin, the primary enzyme in Renner that causes the curds and the whey, and they put it into a microorganism. And they make what's called fermentation-produced chymosin. And that's been used to make cheese since 1990. And at the moment, in industrialized countries like Australia, US and UK, 85 to 90% of all of the cheeses made are made using fermentation-produced chymosin. So if you are eating cheese, you are eating a food made with a product of a genetically modified organism. And if you've been around long enough, you have been for 33 years. So who is now, now that I've told you this story, who is going to stop eating cheese? Put your hands up or simply shout, no more cheese for me. No one? I can add another several hundred people to my list who have n never said that they are going to stop eating cheese. Why? That's because there's something in it for us as consumers. And what's in it for us is being able to enjoy a food that we really love. The problems with GMO before was that there was nothing in it for the consumer. Only for Monsanto, and then the farmers. The consumer went, nothing in it for me. And there's been a lot of um, you know, bad publicity and bad scientific information on the issue of GMOs. And there is a natural GMO crop grown all around the world. And it's actually grown 
widely here in Australia. Would anyone like to have a wild guess of all the horticulture products as what is a naturally transgenic product? I don't blame you, I wouldn't. It's the sweet potato. Around 8,000 years ago, a bacterium called agrobacterium inserted some of its DNA into the sweet potato. Recent research has found out of the 291 cultivars tested, every single one had agrobacterium bacterial genes in its DNA. Anyone here going to, if you're in the sweet potato industry, you're going to stop growing sweet potatoes now? Anyone going to stop eating sweet potatoes? I'm not. Sweet potato fries, my favourite fries of the whole lot. I'm not stopping eating that. If it hasn't been anyone for 8,000 years, I figure I'm pretty safe. So all these things about genetically modified foods, I don't think we need to really fear that. This, this is education required. There's all sorts of things we need to do. But I can find no credible scientific evidence that genetically modified foods themselves cause any problems to humans or animals. Now, contaminants, glyphosate, pesticides, other things, yep, that's fine. And I understand some people have a philosophical objection to genetically modifying um, plants and animals. I understand that. But there is no credible information, scientific information, that says GMOs are a problem. And the biggest trial of feeding GMO to animals is the 95% of all meat and dairy animals in the US fed genetically modified crops. If there was a problem, I think the cattle industry and the dairy industry would be going, if you'll pardon the expression, ape shit right at this very moment. Right? As the FDA in the US says, cows do not become grass and chickens do not become corn. We cannot absorb the DNA from our food. Now, to give you a couple of examples of some uh, cutting edge technologies that are going on, we have something called plant molecular farming, or I call it growing animals in plants. Well, maybe not the entire animal, maybe just a small bit of the animal. A company here called Nobel Foods, they have inserted the gene for casein into soybeans. They grow the soybeans, extract the casein, and use that to make cheese. Now, they've raised over 100 million Oz dollars, planted their first crop last year, and we should see test products on the market this year. And another product from growing animals in plants is from a company in Israel called Polopo. Now, they're just a startup, but they've inserted the gene for an egg white protein, ovalbumin, into potatoes. They plan to grow the potatoes, extract the egg white proteins, and then use the rest of the potato for starches and other products. And with avian influenza around at the moment, and again, the Russia-Ukraine war, there's been a huge impact on the egg supply. Prices of eggs in many places of the world are sky high, and big CPG companies are going, hey, my um, supply of egg white protein has been affected here. My prices are going, I can't predict my prices. So technologies like these can be very, very important. And one maybe a bit close to the home is growing ingredients in lettuce. A company called Pigmentum are growing genetically modified lettuce and they're growing vanillin, which is the, obviously the flavor compound in your vanilla essence, and also food colorings in lettuce. And one of the big advantages of using lettuce over things like soy and so on is, of course, it grows much, much faster. So that's just some examples of how all these exponential technologies are coming into the food and ag system. But the thing is, and we've had people touch on this this morning, is what about consumers? Because it doesn't matter if you have a wonderful product, if consumers won't buy it, then you've got a big problem. And who are the consumers that you should be thinking about? Now, everybody hears about all the time about Gen Z this, or if they're American friends, Gen Z, all the time. Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z. But if you're looking to the long-term future of food 2030 and 2040, you need to be looking to Gen Alpha. 
These are the people born from 2010 to 2024, immediately after Gen Z. They're the ones that will determine the long-term future of food. And if we have a look at you know, their experience, I mean, these Gen Alphas and some ways Gen Z, they're not just digital natives. They are technology natives. They've grown up with Spot the Boston Dynamics dancing robot, mRNA vaccines, smartphones, streaming internet, private corporations shooting rockets into space, and probably in their lifetime, a colony on Mars. They haven't known any other reality but technology. And if we look to try and predict what their attitudes will be to using technology in food, it is difficult because obviously most of them are children. And quite rightly, doing a lot of market research on children is, is frowned upon. But if we have a look at some of the recent studies done on Gen Z and previous generations, 78% of Gen Z have said that they would be comfortable with trying products, food products made with technology. Gen Y, that drops to 67%. Boomers and um, Gen X are tied at 58%. So if we don't extrapolate that, it's highly likely that Gen Alpha will be very accepting of technology being used to make their food. And looking ahead at what will these consumers want. And as Max pointed out in his previous presentation, functional foods more than simply tasty fuel. The consumers of the future are going to want products that do something for them that are functional. So in other words, if I have a big meeting with a client tomorrow and I want to be top of my game, I want to be on the ball, I want to get that contract or that speaking gig, and I'm having breakfast, I want my breakfast in the future to help me do that. But if I'm on my mega yacht in Saint-Tropez the following week and I'm having breakfast, I probably don't want my eyes to be darting around searching and be at the top of my game. I want to relax. Now, the point of that is that we've always looked at products by their day part. In other words, are they breakfast, lunch, dinner, or snacks? But I think that way of thinking is outmoded. People also want their events taken into account. What do I want this food to do for me, and what function will it perform for me? And in the future, that's going to become more and more important. And just a couple of examples here. Well, this is one that work that's been done on cranberries by a company called Brightseed using their Forager AI. And there's 156 bioactives known in the literature. Forager has already found 637 bioactives in cranberries alone. And then we have the cashew apple. Now, not a lot of cashews grown in Australia, but for every kilo of cashews, you have five kilos of the cashew apple. And that's generous either dispose of or use for animal feed. And people say that, oh yes, the reason that we feed this to animals is animals can upcycle human inedible food. I say there's no such thing as human inedible food. There's only products that haven't been yet processed to make them edible for humans. And I think that you know, these products and the ability to be upcycled is going to be increasingly important as we address food waste and getting enough food to feed the planet. And work done on the cashew apple has shown it's got amazing nutritional benefits. It can improve the taste and texture of products, particularly alternative protein products. Now, you might look at me and say, hey, Tony, you know, this is a bit far-fetched. But all of these technologies I've shown you, they are science fact, not science fiction. Yes, some of them are here now, and some of them may take years, some of them may take decades to come to commercialization. But they're all here right now. And when you say that it's far-fetched, remember our friend here. Remember, four million times the storage, one one-thousandth of the cost at one one-hundredth of the weight, and all in under 50 years. 
Similarly, all of the technologies we need to make our tech financial food future come to reality are already here. And while you're thinking things again are far-fetched, remember, today's reality was yesterday's science fiction. Just imagine trying to describe today's reality of 2023 to someone back in the year 2000. Maybe your younger self, if you've been around that long, and they wouldn't have believed you. They would have said that the reality we experience today was simply just science fiction. Go back to 1973, and not only wouldn't they have believed you, they probably have had you locked up. And technology is not going away. Whether we like it or not, exponential change is coming to the food and ag industry. And my bet is that by 2040, we'll see products on the supermarket shelves containing ingredients that we've never seen before. And many of them will use these exponential technologies. And others of these products are just simply currently ideas in the minds of a few um, startup founders. So, what? Sorry. So, we don't, though, have to fear change. If we adopt a exponential mindset, it provides us with the means and an understanding to be able to look at the exponential food future and navigate our way through the maze. It provides us with a roadmap. And what does all this mean, though, for the horticulture industry? Well, as I say, all of these technologies I've shown you today are already here. And combined with consumer trends, they offer enormous opportunities to sell more than just a simple crop or a piece of fruit or a piece of food. Now, let's not forget some of the medicines and drugs that we take for granted today came originally from plants. Aspirin was originally found in the bark of the willow tree. Metformin, which is a frontline drug for treating type 2 diabetes, and also potentially a longevity drug, was originally found in the French lilac. There's an enormous amount of potential beneficial products in the plant kingdom, and we're barely just scratching the surface of what we can find. And the other thing is, these technologies and consumer trends, they show us that it's dangerous to think linearly in an exponential world. And if we just take the simple linear approach in horticulture of concentrating on increasing yields, more marketing, doing the same old, same old, this is not the key to the long-term future of horticulture. So what we need to do is we need to look at how we can bring these technologies to bear and challenge ourselves to actually look at how horticulture can be at the forefront of all of these changes and how you can use these technologies to reap the benefits, the maximum benefits, of all these exponential change in technologies. Welcome to our Horticulture's Exponential Future 2040. Thank you.